Thanks, Niall. Uh, Niall. Um, and now <clears throat> we're going to continue with uh, our uh, next presenter, who is going to be um, also um, not online, but yeah, uh, on video. This is Claire Kelly from um, Trinity College in Dublin, and she's going to um, talk about rethinking academia in time of climate crisis. Hi, everyone. I'm delighted to be part of the symposium on rethinking brain imaging research in a time of socio-ecological crisis at OHBM 2024. I'm really sorry not to be there in person. Uh, perhaps predictably enough for a participant in this symposium, I've committed to flying less, but I'm really grateful for the opportunity to contribute from afar. I'm also really sorry about my voice, which is uh, the tail end of a virus. I'm going to talk about a paper that I co-authored with Anna Arai from Leiden University, calling for an urgent rethinking of academia so that universities can lead the way in the transformative action that is needed to address our planetary crisis. Our paper is over a year old now, but it's more relevant than ever because nothing about our predicament has changed. Despite four decades of commitments, protocols, agreements, Greenhouse gas emissions generated by human activities, primarily burning fossil fuels, continue to rise unabated and have already increased global temperatures by at least 1.3 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. And then in addition to this global warming and the climate change that's caused, human activities have transgressed safe planetary boundaries for land and fresh water use, nitrogen and phosphorus flows, and the impacts of novel entities. And we're also driving a sixth mass extinction, the largest loss of life on Earth since the time of the dinosaurs. Our failure to stem global warming risks triggering planetary tipping points, dramatic shifts in vital Earth systems on which life on Earth depends, which cannot be undone. And this is not just a climate crisis. It is a global poly crisis of inequality and environmental destruction wrought by capitalism. And as I'm sure this audience is well aware, the ecological emergency directly threatens the well-being, safety and livelihoods of those alive today and future generations. But most important, these adverse impacts are not equally distributed across the world. And those who have contributed least to the planetary crisis are suffering the greatest and most immediate impacts. And the severity of those adverse impacts today and in the future depends on our actions now. Our actions matter, but globally, we're not doing enough. We are in a world, a better world than with no one with no climate policies, but our current trajectory is completely inconsistent with the goal of keeping warming below even two degrees Celsius by the end of the century. So what we need is a deep and immediate ramping down of fossil fuel use, particularly across global North countries to have a chance of stemming the worst warning. So why is there this huge gap between what we're doing and what we need to do? Well, analyses of our collective failure to bend the global emissions curve repeatedly identify the powerful role of vested interests, particularly fossil fuel companies. And these fossil fuel companies maintain their legitimacy through ingrained social norms and the support of societal institutions, including academia. So this report on screen from The Guardian is just one of many showing how the fossil fuel industry and adjacent industries greenwash and legitimize their activities through partnerships with academic institutions. So as academics, we have a central role to play in the push to stop supporting and legitimizing policies, practices and industries that harm our biosphere. And I mean all academics here, including neuroscientists, neuroimagers, because those who've been working in the climate science and ecosystem space have been shouting at the top of their lungs for two decades now and more. And they can't do this alone. We can't expect them to. We have to join in. 
And both recent and not so recent history shows us that academics have a long history of speaking truth to power. A fantastic paper by Fernando Racimo and colleagues outlines how advocacy and activism were once hallmarks of academia, as their timeline of scientists throughout the ages shows. From the women's suffrage movement, environmental protection, anti-war and anti-nuclear proliferation, to more recent actions including scientists' rebellion and our colleagues and students who have protested the genocide in Gaza. Academics urgently need to re-embrace advocacy and activism. Yet we're not doing it. Academics and universities are really failing to lead the societal transformation that is needed to address the crises that we face. And we have enormous potential to catalyze this kind of transformative societal change. Thanks to our twin missions, our research can inform policy for mitigation adaptation while the privilege that we have of educating the next generation has the potential to set off powerful ripple effects that ultimately provoke system change. Yet, understandably, many of us feel unable to do much about the climate crisis. And particularly as neuroscientists, we can feel that our research is unrelated, that we don't have the right expertise, or that our actions will have little impact. And these are definitely barriers that people face. But we think that an even greater barrier to action amongst academics is our increasingly corporatized, target-driven and stressful nature of modern academic life, which far exceeds reasonable human limits and leaves us with no energy or headspace to engage with the planetary crisis. So to remove these barriers to action, we argue that we need to rethink academia uh, because there will be no universities or research on a dead planet. So it turns out that an ideal framework for this rethinking already exists. And I hope that people might be familiar with Kay, Kate Rayworth's Donut Economics. In her incredibly influential book from 2017, which has sparked a whole movement, Rayworth argues that outdated economic thinking and economic teaching has led humanity to the twin crises of profound global inequality and ecological chaos. So to work our way out, Rayworth suggests that we need to think about economics in a whole new way. And at the heart of her framework is a donut made up of an inner and an outer ring. So the inner ring is the set of social foundations for human well-being that we should provide, that every economy, every society should provide, like water, food, housing, education, health, a political voice, peace. The outer ring are those planetary boundaries that I mentioned earlier that we must not overshoot, like biodiversity loss and climate change. And Rayworth's call to action is that societies should not aspire to infinite economic growth on a finite planet, but instead to live well within the ecologically safe and socially just space within the donut. So to enable this, Rayworth outlines seven new principles of economic thought, fundamental shifts in our thinking. And in our paper, we applied Rayworth's tools and Rayworth's new ways of thinking to academia. So first, we imagine an academic donut bounded by an inner social foundation secure, satisfying careers, academic freedom, true equality, diversity and inclusion, and then outer human and planetary ceilings on dimensions like workload, commercialization, as well as our planetary impacts. So we suggest that modern academia and the neoliberal university increasingly falls short of providing the social foundation while overshooting our boundaries. So to move academia into a socially just and safe space within the donut, 
uh, we examine seven dominant, unhelpful ways of thinking and propose new ways for rethinking academia. I'm not going to be able to do full justice to each of these in this short talk, so I hope you will read the paper for yourself. But the first is that we need to change the goal. Corporatization of the university has led to demoralizing and time-consuming metric fixation. So instead of producing more, 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 more graduates, more grants, more papers, more patents, we need to realign our goals with a donut-informed perspective on what the university is for. As Donella Meadows taught us, changing the goal is one of the most difficult system changes, but it's also the most important, or one of the most important. Our second is get savvy with systems. Overwork, time poverty, um, and the internalization of unhelpful norms makes us believe that we're nothing more than cogs in the machine. Instead, we need to take a system lens that will empower us to see the university as an organic, diverse and dynamic system in which we can identify leverage points for change. Many of us have positions within the university that would enable us to dismantle or at least disrupt harmful practices. And that's particularly true for those of us who have tenure. Uh, with the privilege of that career security comes responsibility to stop playing the game and to work for change. The third is to see the big picture. We need to abandon notions that academia exists within some isolated ivory tower and instead appreciate that we are embedded within society and the planet. We need to recognize that larger historic and societal trends affect academic life um, and that our biases, privileges and viewpoints shape the work that we do and help perpetuate racial and economic injustices. Seeing the big picture also means understanding our role in the planetary crisis, examining not only our carbon footprint, but our carbon shadow and ending activities that support, legitimize and maintain the fossil fuel industry. We need to center climate justice in our actions and in our education on the climate and biodiversity crisis. By changing ourselves, we can lead the way for societal change. We need to create to regenerate, embrace slow scholarship, abandon the rat race, value the community building, deep thinking and rest that's crucial for intellectual work. This might mean less output, less quantity, but more quality. It means also fighting precarity and valuing that privilege we have of uh, educating the next generation. We also need to nurture human nature, ask what true success looks like. Rather than prioritizing individuals, valuing high impact papers and awards and unhealthy competition, we need to think about uh, teamwork, sustaining communities, mentoring, education, service and outreach, reward and champion these and prioritize team science rather than lone leaders. The sixth is to design to distribute. We know that academic funding is broken. We know that academic publishing are broken. Um, the pro competitive um, funding schemes uh, with very low payout rates are incredibly demoralizing and waste time and compound the Matthew effect. In addition, for-profit publishing and IP generation enclose public goods, the fruits of taxpayer-funded academic labor for private profit. But this is one area in which there's already really hopeful signs of change calls and proposals for fairer funding systems and the open science revolution which has really taken hold in your imaging uh, as well as more um, disruptive actions like sci-hub show that there is huge appetite and capacity for change the final is to be agnostic about growth the academic donor prioritizes a more organic a uh, growth agnostic university where we nurture and value what we have and seek to regrow trust in science rather than growing student numbers, papers, grants and so on. We have a responsibility to live up to our privileged position by taking time to inform ourselves about the climate and biodiversity crisis and to advocate for change in the university and beyond. 
So we suggest that these several alternative ways of thinking can help forge a path towards the safe and just space within the academic donut and that this in turn can help and enable academics to take a leading role in the economic and social transformation that is needed to address our planetary and uh, social crisis. We recognise that this is an enormous task, so we say please join us in making Donut Academia a reality. As is the case for any successful movement, change starts with collective, sustained, local action. Our individual actions are absolutely not sufficient to bring about change, but they are necessary. And the good news is that collective action is an effort multiplier. Talking with colleagues, friends, families, breaking the climate science is one of the most powerful things that we can do. Because when we don't speak up about issues that concern us, we exacerbate a false social reality in which it seems the majority don't care. But research shows us that questioning or contradicting norms can help trigger social tipping points when just 25% of people support a new social norm, the majority opinion shifts. This is why finding your community is so important. Solidarity is sustaining and adding your voice can be a leverage point for further action. So what are some concrete things that you can do? Here is a list. I'm not going to go into them in detail. You'll also find them in our paper. We suggest starting small, trying to set aside some of that, that bullshit work um, and instead work um, your way to what Dr. Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson has identified as the sweet spot of climate action. That's the intersection of what needs doing, what you're good at, and what brings you joy. And, and just remembering that piece about solidarity being sustaining and needing to find your community. So I hope some of this has resonated with you. Please don't hesitate to reach out to Anna or myself and check out the resources like re, um, workshop materials that are available at the, the website shown there. That QR code will take you there. Thank you so much for listening.